Good morning, everyone. My name is Peter Dorr, and my group and I are here to present the reasons why the rise of China poses a major challenge to U.S. interests, necessitating an assertive response. Subsequently, we will present a detailed policy proposal pursuing diplomatic, economic, and military action. We will, clearly demonstrate, we will clearly demonstrate the risks the United States and our allies face if the proper steps are not taken, as well as the best course of action to limit the challenge China poses to the existing ordered status quo. For more than 40 years, the United States has pursued a policy of engagement with China. The intent of this was China becoming a responsible stakeholder in the international system, with some hoping that a process of liberalization and democratization would eventually occur. Unfortunately, Despite continued American engagement and cooperation, the Chinese Communist Party held an increasingly concrete belief that the United States was attempting to encircle China in systems of alliances, while also undermining the CCP's legitimacy through proclamations of a liberal world order. In response to this, Beijing moved directly away from liberalization, undertaking repressive and nationalist measures domestically and engaging in mercantilism and assertive coercive policies abroad. These processes were continued and exacerbated with Xi Jinping's rise to power in 2012. The essence of his vision was the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, returning to a historical age of immense global influence. He set an aggressive schedule for regional control, as well as global military power in the near future. Examining Chinese actions since Xi's rise to power clearly demonstrates that engagement has failed from a military perspective, an economic perspective, and in terms of Chinese influence and ideology. Under Xi in Xi's influence, China is now a serious threat in each of these three areas. Economically, China is a clear rival to the United States. The strength of China's economy is soon to surpass that of the U.S., with metrics suggesting that Chinese GDP will outgrow the U.S.'s by 2030. China is the world's largest trading power, as well as the greatest source of global lending. As one, of, as one of Beijing's primary goals, China is progressing towards becoming a more technologically advanced economy. The United States will inevitably face a reduction in, in influence if we are finally usurped as the world's largest economy, and while it will not be immediate, China's military strength would eventually mirror that of the U.S. as military capabilities typically tend to lag behind economic growth. Beijing leverages this economic strength to coerce companies and other countries through trade and through business-related threats effectively guaranteeing that any economic actor which wants to benefit from relations with China will limit any language critical of the CCP or its actions. Militarily, China has progressed rapidly in recent years. With consistent large increases to military spending, China is moving towards a goal of complete military modernization. China outnumbers the United States in military personnel, as well as critical types of equipment, weaponry, and vehicles. With a recent emphasis on naval buildup, China has expanded its maritime domain and general military reach. China's nuclear arsenal is also constantly improving in both size and quality, with nuclear modernization being a major goal of Beijing's. In recent years, China has worked to both cement and expand its reach within the South China Sea through claiming islands which are territorially disputed, as well as artificially constructing others to serve as military outposts. This military progress, in conjunction with changes in government rhetoric, is highly threatening. Beijing has become markedly more aggressive on issues of sovereignty, fanning the flames of Chinese nationalism. This, of course, directly relates to the most highly discussed point of conflict between the United States and China, Taiwan. There are numerous signals that Beijing is reconsidering a peaceful approach to reunification. The Chinese government and military plan to prevail in a conflict over Taiwan, even if the U.S. directly intervenes. American war games conducted by both RAND and the Pentagon confirm this assessment, predicting that a conflict over Taiwan would end in a decisive and likely swift Chinese victory. Furthermore, given the rise of nationalism in China, it is likely that Xi Jinping will find it politically untenable not to invade once he has the military capabilities to do so. Likelihood of imminent invasion is further worsened by statements made by Chinese trading partners who refuse to let Taiwan derail their relationships with Beijing. China has undergone major efforts to expand its global influence to counter that of the United States, most clearly with the Belt and Road Initiative. One key tool Beijing uses is debt trap diplomacy, extending debt to developing nations in exchange for greater political leverage over them. 
Xi has abandoned any efforts to limit posing China as a direct ideological challenger to the West. Now, Beijing openly offers its own mix of authoritarianism and state-controlled economics as a model option for developing nations to, as Xi has put it, speed up their development while preserving their independence. China is also providing significant economic support for U.S. adversaries, such as Russia, Iran, and Venezuela. China clearly poses a revisionist economic and military-related threat. This is a sharp reversal from when China was focused on hiding its strength and biding its time. It is expanding its military reach, acquiring new territory, growing to become the world's greatest economy, fanning nationalist flames, flames domestically, and looking to reshape the international system in its favor. It is also constantly looking to build new alliances while undermining our own. We are truly in a decisive decade where the China threat will more than likely come to a head. Therefore, we must take decisive steps to address all natures of the threat. My teammates will outline our proposal for the set of policies which will most effectively accomplish this goal. Jamie Watson will discuss our economic policies, working to reduce our allies and our reliance on China, improving American production in key areas, and limiting Chinese economic prospects. Ben Alexander will detail our recommendation for diplomatic efforts to establish multilateral security agreements in the Indo-Pacific, while separately working to tighten our connection in all areas with India, all in efforts to limit and balance against Chinese regional power. Lastly, Ivan Naidu will cover our recommended changes to the American military posture, increases in spending and development, and the specifics of our approach to safeguarding Taiwan, endeavoring to deter Chinese aggression to the greatest extent possible, while guaranteeing that aggression is unsuccessful if it does come to pass. We face an emboldened China, which looks to surpass the United States in all areas. If we do not take serious steps to meet this challenge, we will exit this decisive, this decisive decade on China's revisionist terms. If, instead, we enact the assertive policies which my team and I are proposing, the United States can capitalize on our existing advantages and ensure that the U.S. no longer faces these challenges from China. To start, here's Jamie. My name is Jamie Watson, <clears throat> and today I'll be talking about steps that we can take to counter China and keep America's economic edge. The U.S.'s centrality in the global economic system has been a principal reason for our country's enduring strength and prosperity. As Peter just explained, today we see a China that is bent on challenging our historically secure trade status and laying groundwork for economic coercion of us and our allies. An Indo-Pacific region economically dominated by China is one where the U.S. is not in control of its own fate, is subject to trade on China's terms, and is boxed out of dialogue with important regional allies. But while the risks of inaction are pressing, we also have a critical window of opportunity. The increasing dangers of China's regional ambitions have illustrated to countries like India and the Philippines that sole reliance on China is an unacceptable status. As the COVID-19 pandemic and the Russia-Ukraine war have demonstrated, supply chain snarls can suddenly and dramatically hamper access to goods. The Russia-Ukraine war, in particular, has demonstrated the danger of over-reliance on a single risky country's exports. European countries, like Germany, today appear to be learning their lessons by investing in energy outside of Russia. And as China engages in increasingly bold attempts at economic coercion of us and our allies, we have an opportunity to secure lasting trade ties with regional allies who are wary of repeating Germany's errors. So with these concerns in mind, our economic approach has two pillars reinforce internationally and build up domestically. These twin policies work in concert with each other, both adding up to a reassertion of the U.S. as a capable and secure trading partner that is firmly repudiating China's attempts at hegemony. U.S. engagement in the Indo-Pacific, done properly, will both enhance our own economic position and blunt China's efforts to become the only power in the region. Diversification of trade outside of China makes our supply chains and those of our allies more resilient. By engaging regional markets and producers alike, we can reduce reliance on China. Close regional partners like Japan and Australia know firsthand how willing China is to use trade as a tool to bully countries into submission. Amid territorial disputes over the Senkaku Islands in the East China Sea, Beijing has restricted Japan's rare earth metal imports. And after the Australian government criticized Chinese trade policies, China responded with tariffs on Australian exports. Revealingly, these two countries joined the United States to form the Quad, a strategic security dialogue formed in 2017 to counter China's rise in the Indo-Pacific. Engaging countries like these in efforts to diversify our supply chains will thus also achieve the effect of reducing Chinese leverage. 
India, the other country in the Quad, represents a particularly ripe opportunity for such policies. It is both the newly crowned most populous country in the world and one of the fastest growing economies. And like other allies mentioned, it has seen increasing hostility from China, including the revival of long dormant border clashes. My colleague Ben will talk later in more depth about other ways we can draw India closer, particularly in the security realm. But economically, it is yet another example of a way for the US to secure trade on favorable terms and to prevent China from doing so. Our administration has taken steps towards such trade policies that draw on these countries. Chief among these steps has been the negotiation in 2022 of the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for Prosperity, or IPEF, an agreement between 13 countries in the region and the US. This effort rightly puts emphasis on improving coordination and beefing up US supply chains. But today, it currently runs the risk of being undermined by the insertion of overreaching domestic priorities. Regulatory measures that are significantly different from member countries' existing rules threaten to undermine any supply chain gains we'll get from this agreement. This is especially true because the IPEF is not structured as a traditional free trade agreement, and as a result, does not lower tariff barriers to member countries. So dropping these unrealistic sections of the agreement and making it clear that its primary focus is allied trade is essential to making the IPEF work and maximizing U.S. gains. Countering China also means ensuring that we have the best technology and that they don't. This demands export restrictions on both advanced semiconductors and parts essential to manufacturing those semiconductors, export restrictions like the ones announced in October of last year. It also demands robust support for Taiwan. My colleague Aiden will talk later in detail about our plan for securing Taiwan, but right now I'll impress upon you the importance of that security from an economic dimension. Today, Taiwan manufactures 60% of the world's semiconductors, including 90% of the most advanced ones. Ensuring both that the U.S. continues to benefit from this production and that China does not have the capacity to harness or disrupt it is critical. Semiconductors bring us to another key point, that in some measures, supply chain strength alone will not suffice. The technologies of the future, essential to our national security, must be made in the U.S. The recent Bipartisan Chips and Science Act is a prime example of the type of investment we need to see, prioritizing American manufacturing in critical areas, technology and energy. Especially combined with the export controls I mentioned or earlier, this legislation represents U.S. advances as well as a strike against Chinese ability to get premier technology. If done right, our domestic buildup is not at odds with partnership in the region. We aren't engaged in wholesale protectionism, but instead a policy of made in America where it counts. Indeed, technology transfers and the opening up of investment to Indo-Pacific allies is a key element of the IPEF program mentioned earlier. Combined, the two pillars of our economic approach put forward a policy that secures the U.S.'s edge as the dominant trading player in the region by strengthening our supply chains. At a time where China seeks to bully countries into submission, our approach will insulate allies from coercion and reduce dependence on Beijing. In a competition to build the technologies of the future, the U.S. will have the upper hand, taking national security into our own hands. And above all, our plan positions the U.S. to win this decisive decade by maintaining an economic system on our own terms. Next up, my colleague Ben will talk about how we plan to counter China by expanding and refocusing alliances. My name is Benjamin Alexander, and I will be proposing a series of U.S. responses to the increasing threat of Chinese interference in other states in the Indo-Pacific region. One of the United States' key competitive advantages in our conflict with China is our tradition of robust alliance networks. By rallying other states to our cause, we improve our military and economic outlook while legitimizing our leadership in the region. China knows our strength in this arena and has undertaken broad efforts to undermine our existing alliances and spread their own influence through debt trap diplomacy and economic extortion in an attempt to bully neighbors into submission, directly harming U.S. allies and interests. As we enter our decisive decade in our confrontation with China, we need to go further to support our allies and expand our network. The United States must take a two-pronged approach. One, we must develop cooperation among our existing partners in the Indo-Pacific for short and medium-term priorities. And two, we must move India into our corner for a long-term payoff. Now, our alliances with Japan, South Korea, and Australia are the bedrock of a strong alliance policy, and we have strong existing relationships with each. Japan has formulated an effective response to the Belt and Road Initiative, its quality infrastructure program, which develops soft, ties in, soft power ties in Southeast Asia while constructing necessary infrastructure throughout the region. 
Our usage of their bases is additionally a key strategic launch pad for operations in the defense of Taiwan, which Japan has pledged to support. We must encourage greater military buildup and foreign investment, playing to our mutual interests in that relationship. South Korea is a strong ally with deep-seated ties to the United States and strong economic relationships with China. South Korea and Japan have tightened relations in recent months after a breakdown in 2018. Maintaining strong bilateral ties between these two states is a critical aspect of managing relations with both. The United States needs to push for greater trust building and integration to improve military interoperability. Australia is another ally we've recently reinforced, sharing advanced military technology, equipment, and practices through the AUKUS group in coordination with the United Kingdom. As a key regional partner, we must continue to support AUKUS technology and military sharing, continuing to improve military interoperability and reach in the Southeast Asian and South Pacific regions. Our bilateral relationship with each of these states is strong, and we should work to increase multilateral cooperation among our states while using these relationships as models to build new alliances. One key state to bring closer is the Philippines. This is a strong democracy in the middle of the South China Sea conflict, whose northern end is about half as close to Taiwan as Okinawa is. Following a reset in relations, we've gained permission to station American ships and soldiers in nine bases throughout the country as well as enhancements to existing annual exercises. The US and the Philippines are conducting joint naval patrols to assert Filipino sovereignty over their territorial waters. Despite these advances, there are threats on the horizon. China has fired back by offering considerable foreign aid and direct investment into the Philippines, targeting strategic infrastructure like railways and telecommunications, thereby limiting our ability to use those key assets in the event of a crisis. Investing into these strategic industries would help cement our relationship with the Philippines. Additionally, we need to continue our capacity building efforts with the Filipino military, developing their own capabilities to protect themselves so they can better stand up to Chinese aggression in the region. With strong and secure Philippines, we gain frontline military bases and a large, powerful, and populous ally at the front lines of our conflict with China, meeting our short and medium term needs. India is the only potential long-term balancing ally in a confrontation with China. It has territorial disputes with China in the Himalayan mountains and a stated interest in maintaining control of naval space in the Indian Ocean. These twin security issues align well with the United States' concern over Chinese adventurism. Uh, the Indian government understands that China cannot be counted upon to act as a responsible stakeholder. And, however, India also has strong security relations with Russia and a tradition of non-aligndism. Our goal must be to bring India towards us in the long run. Towards that end, the United States should make efforts to upgrade our relationship explicitly and implicitly with India. This should include military defense coordination, both in production as well as in exercises. This should include increased efforts for bilateral trade and foreign direct investment. It should also include diplomatic support for Indian claims, seeking to trade support against Pakistan from us, for support against China from India. Our administration has started down this path with a historic agreement to construct jet fighter, engine, jet fighter engines in India and collaborate in the IPEF. But we don't expect a massive change overnight. The potential payoff for stronger relations is so high that the investment is worth it. With an effective policy in 20 or 30 years, we will be talking about Indo-American trade and security cooperation, forcing China to worry about two fronts of competition instead of just one and serving as a stable foundation on which to build American leadership in the Indo-Pacific. Our two prongs, India over the long run and the Philippines, Japan, and other allies in the short term, enable us to effectively mitigate the threat China poses to American interests at home and abroad. Now, my, call in, my colleague Ivan will discuss military responses to improve chi uh, American deterrence against China. My name is Ivan Naidu, and I'm going to be discussing the military threat that China poses and how we can engage with that threat. Black one, sorry. Oh. In 1990, China spent $9 billion on their military. Today, that number is 200 and 80 billion, and it's funding the world's largest navy, a domestically built fifth generation fighter and an overseas base in Djibouti and illegal islands across the South China Sea. 
given this buildup in military power, China is undeniably the security challenge of the Indo-Pacific. And where we see this play out is in Taiwan. Not only can we no longer guarantee overwhelming naval superiority in the South China Sea, but we cannot ignore a rhetorical shift towards militaristic unification by Chinese leaders, virtualic nationalism in Chinese media, and unprovoked incursions from, Ch the, from the Chinese military into Taiwanese territory. Due to this, in the next five to 10 years, an invasion of Taiwan by China is more likely than at any time since the 1950s. And it is vital that we would intervene. Why? Not only to protect our semiconductors, but Taiwan's position <coughs> would give China submarine and naval air services unprecedented access and control of the South China Sea. At the same time, if we betray Taiwan, it destroys the credibility that we gain, scuppering the alliances and economic ties we foment with our allies, but most importantly, it rewards China militarily for their coercion and bullying. We are shifting from strategic ambiguity to strategic clarity. We think it would be redundant to have both deterrence and ambiguity, and we think that in response to China's bold aggression, an American bold response is needed to maintain our own credibility. But as we've seen China behave aggressively under ambiguity, we think that regardless of if we work under ambiguity or clarity, China's aggression would be the same. All ambiguity does is make it harder for us to use our military to deter China. We're going to start by building up our Navy. We're going to move away from what the Navy call Death Stars. These are large vessels likely to be destroyed in the opening salvos of a conflict. We want to move to a larger fleet of smaller vessels, particularly unmanned vessels that can penetrate China's aerial denial system. We want to move oh, about two fleets to the South China Sea. And in regards to Taiwan, We're going to continue a porcupine effort. That's giving Taiwan lots of solder launch weaponry and anti-shipping missiles. At the same time, we want to continue stockpiling American anti-shipping missiles of our own and hardening our bases in the region. But we're not blind to the threat that China poses outside of Taiwan. We want to continue our freedom of navigation exercises so that the South China Sea is free for all nations. And we want to continue expanding the military aid we provide to our allies. We've already spoken about weaning India off of Russian military hardware, but we also want to provide South Korea with high altitude defense missiles. We want to help build up Japan's Navy. We want to help Australia with long endurance patrol craft including nuclear submarines. And to help our allies in the Philippines, we want to build up their coast guard to protect their fishing fleets from China's maritime militia. China is a threat. But with the military buildup, the porcupining of Taiwan, and the aid we give to our allies, we can prevail in deterrence and, if need be, in engagement. I leave to my colleague Peter to conclude. We are in a decisive decade, and how we act regarding the threat that China poses has vitally important implications. A passive approach will allow, and even facilitate, continued Chinese growth in all critical areas, guaranteeing that it will surpass the U.S. in economic strength soon and military capacity only slightly later. Without a robust response, China will become the established predominant power in the Indo-Pacific region, gain more international influence, and acquire more coercive leverage. Eventually, China will credibly threaten to overturn the existing international order in favor of one that operates according to Chinese interests and in line with Chinese ideologies. Conversely, 
If our assertive policies are undertaken in an effective manner, the United States will preserve and extend our advantage both militarily and economically. In 10 years, the United States will be a leader of production in critical industries. We will be involved in key systems of alliances and will have strengthened our bilateral relations with important allies. Our allies will experience notable economic and military gains and will in turn heighten their contributions to key issues like Taiwan. The existing global order will not face serious ideological threats from China and the Chinese economic threat in all its many forms will be greatly diffused. There will be no clear risk of major military conflict over Taiwan or the South China Sea. And finally, a more restrained China, less focused on imminent great power competition, will be more likely to cooperate on the existential issues facing the globe today. If we implement our assertive strategy, China will no longer pose the immense threat that it does. The U.S. will have cemented its position of prosperity and credibility. From this position of strength, the U.S. will be ready to lead the world in facing transnational issues moving forward. Thank you. I'll start with a few biggies that can go to any of the panelists um, that are, a, uh, of course, last two questions, but uh, they are intimately related. Uh, so question number one, what do you see as the risks of your proposed strategies? And tied to that, how do you anticipate that China will respond to such an assertive set of policies? Uh, I don't imagine they're going to sit back and say, yeah, sure, okay, you know, we, we understand what, what you're doing and make makes sense to us, so no harm, no foul. Uh, and mightn't we end up another step or a rung higher in an escalatory ladder, maybe moving towards a conflict spiral? It's a lot in, embedded in there. <laughs> Answer them as you wish. Of course. As all policies, our policy does have risks, and we are aware, aware of those risks. Um, there are individual risks in each of the areas that we have covered, diplomatically, economically, and militarily. Um, the most pressing risk that I, I believe most people would look toward would be the risk of um, escalation of conflict over Taiwan. Um, or more broadly. Or more broadly, of course, in the South China Sea or anywhere else. Um, and while we are aware of this risk, as my colleague Ivan, me Ivan mentioned during his proposal, um, we believe that China is maintaining an aggressive stance regardless of American action or lack thereof. And in that case, we want to best prepare ourselves and our allies to respond. Um, and we believe that if Chinese aggression is not to the extent that we view it, um, our policies and our actions will prepare the United States moving forward um, regardless of China's actions. I, I think it's also important to note um you know, de deterrence, we, we at least argue that deterrence has a very strong, um, strong sort of defensive capability in this manner. You know, we are seeking to, em you know, embolden our allies, embolden ourselves, not necessarily as an aggressive action on China's core interests, um, its domestic, its kind of domestic security, but rather looking at, all right, how can we defend the Philippines, which is actively being, you know, incurred upon? How can we defend Japan, which has um, kind of significant territorial disputes, and how can we, um, in the event of a of an armed conflict in Taiwan, how can we um, how can we effectively respond to that? So we are not proposing any kind of like broad-based build-up with the idea of ultimate regime change or attack in China. The the idea is um, we want to try and make it so that China's risk calculus for invading Taiwan is so high that they won't choose to do it, and they'll seek to pursue other more peaceful means of reunification. I think also just to briefly add on the economic dimension, because that's another concern that we had. Uh, we, we were both realistic about the, the dominance that China has in terms of being a, a trading partner to a lot of our allies in the region and us, and also um, to the uh, risks of de like decoupling, as some people would call it, or, or any sort of kind of Cold War mentality. So our approach is, is, is not that, but we would like to build up uh, policy of trade with friends and friend shoring, as some have called it, um, and specifically build up uh, industries at home so that we kind of have our security in our own hands. And then the, I, what that translates to is a longer term economic position where we are not in a position to be like coerced by China, but we still have robust trade ties because those are not going away. Sure. 
sure on, on, on this issue of diplomacy. This, th this issue of, of winning the diplomatic battle seems shot through your whole analysis, that we want to strengthen our alliances and we want to deny China what you called um, uh, leverage over others through trade deals, through Belt and Road, and through other kinds of influence. Over whom does China have leverage today? The presentation that you put up showed that the United States has uh, strong and growing diplomatic ties with basically all the major economic players outside of China and Asia. U.S. ties with Europe have been expanding and deepening. European allies have been aggressively pushing Chinese firms out. Witness what happened to Huawei, right? So. What's the problem? What, who, who is China influencing in this world? Because from your presentation, it looks like China is being diplomatically contained. That's a great question. So I'd first point you towards the huge degree of trade um, that you know, China has with throughout Europe and Asia and parts of um, you know, Latin America. Peter, if you could go back to the um, economic slide, there's a kind of map that shows all the states that uh, you know, are who, for whom the largest trading partner is um, China. They have a huge degree of leverage from their critical trade relations, particularly in certain key industries. Um, and through Taiwan, by threatening Taiwan, they have a chokehold over the semiconductor industry, which is a sort of key um, a key part of our economy and the global uh, economic network. So China is taking a, st a series of specific policies to try to turn their own existing trade ties into diplomatic uh, leverage, or political leverage. Um, they're threatening to cut back on uh, trade, and they're threatening to cut back on um, sort of engagement offerings. They're f they threatened Australia with, an embar with a um, boycott, rather, on their products after Australia tried to speak out against um, Chinese uh, human rights abuses. So there are a series of examples where this has occurred, and I think that paints a broader picture where China, as it's growing, as it's rising, it's seeking to turn its own power into scoring um, points for itself abroad. But, but, every, but every time it tries yeah. to score points, it fails. Mm -hmm. Every time it tries to translate this economic connection to political pressure, it loses. It's tried this with Taiwan, and Taiwan mm -hmm. has gotten closer to the United States. It's tried this with Australia, and Australia has gotten closer to the United States. Mm -hmm. It's tried this over and over again. It tried this in Europe, and Europe got closer to the U.S. position on great power competition. Mm -hmm. So is it true that China's expanding economic footprint actually generates any political leverage at all, or is this something that we're just inventing? Mm -hmm. I could point towards the numerous um, sort of expansions of uh, Chinese influence in international organizations, right? They're sort of reshaping a series of um, rules to really um, shift international organizations from the, kind of the, United, the United States' traditional interest to China's. I think we could also go back towards um, a series of, like, I feel like the examples that you pointed out in Australia, the examples with Lithuania, with Japan, these are all situations where there are traditional American allies who turn back towards the United States' position, right? China is cultivating influence throughout Southeast Asia and throughout Africa, Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, you can point towards the expansion of uh, the yuan, the bilateral yuan trade, right? It's replacing the US dollar with BRICS states. We can look towards um, kind of shifting attempting to increase um, Chinese trade to uh, Brazil, um, a series of other sort of Latin American states. These are all like significant steps that China has taken to replace his roles the U.S. has traditionally held, right? And in that way, at least, um, you know, China's developing leverage that it can effectively use. I mean, also just to quickly jump in there, the fact that we've seen this very over the last few years, surge in American allies in the Indo-Pacific region, also to a lesser extent, Europe getting closer because of China, I think speaks to the fact that China is accelerating its attempt to use economic leverage. And I think that if we sort of take our foot off the gas pedal, if we try to keep things in equilibrium, China is only going to continue to try and score, use their economy to get political points. I think that ultimately, 
the reason these alliances exist or getting Im are getting emboldened is because China is shifting away from its previous policy of biding its time, trying to be a responsible or trying to, or uh, pretending to be a responsible stakeholder. And to say that China isn't scoring political leverage from its economic forays is proof that China is failing. I think it's just to say that China is, is to just underestimate China or to minimize the threat. It, we're looking at not China as a direct threat today, tomorrow. We're looking at them from a very long run perspective and an intermediate perspective as being a, a major challenger to the United States. Let me ask a, a kind of follow up question. Uh, I think some people might say that, that you guys are presenting a, a view of the China threat, a, a China on the rise, a China having more success in coercing others that, that might have, uh, that would have looked a lot more. Uh, accurate, you know, 2018, 2016, but now it seems scholars are much more impressed with China's current weaknesses and, and future weaknesses. Um, is, is there a possibility that you guys are overlooking uh, China's real uh, weaknesses, both domestically, um, it, its failure to uh, successfully coerce others? In other words, do you guys have a view of the China threat that maybe is uh, clearer than the truth, uh, it's not as serious as uh, you're, you're painting it. How would you respond to that, Chris? Of course, um, we've considered that in our in our policy proposal, and like my colleague Ivan just acknowledged, um, under our current view of Chinese economic growth, um, our proposal is much more intermediate. Um, however, if in fact China is facing demographic problems and other domestic issues. Um, and is looking at an imminent economic decline, um, we see the next decade as all the more decisive, given that China will, under Xi's leadership, be aware of the decline they are facing and will then look to capitalize on the peak of their military and economic power. Um, so in our eyes, if there is an existing decline or the possibility of one, um, the possibility for and likelihood of Chinese aggression looking in the near future is even more threatening. Can I follow up on? Yeah, that? absolutely. I, I just and you guys can really, jump in at any moment. Really quickly, I don't understand if this is a long-term problem, as you just said, or if this is a near-term problem. What's the danger to the United States? Is it long-term or short-term? Is it rising China or declining China? As I've as I've discussed, we are in a decisive decade. We view China as rising. Our look at economic metrics and things of that nature leads us to believe that China is a rising economic power. Um, and in that, we are looking at it as a decisive decade problem. So we're looking not only at the next year or two and the possibility of an imminent invasion of Taiwan, but also the economic and diplomatic threat that they pose in the next 10 years. Um, the lack of proper action in that decade causes, of course, long-term problems, as all current actions do. But we are looking at the problem as one that is very much needing to be addressed within the next decade. I mean, I mean I'd also argue that the long, intermediate, and short term aren't mutually exclusive. I think there are very clear short term risks. If China does decline and it feels that it's a peaking power, it's likely to escalate. And if China, in the long term, continues its rise, I think that that puts it as a, the challenger to the United States economically and militarily. And I think that our policy is really designed to address China from an intermediate term, building up those alliances, building up that military aspect. And also from a longer term, we're trying to bring in India, we're trying to shore up our own domestic manufacturing. We're really trying to deal with both. I don't think, you know, not mutually exclusive. So I have one, one direct follow-up on this and then a separate question. I'll tag team both. Uh, the follow-up is, if China is seen by our allies, our potential allies, fence sitters in as problematic way as you're describing, why doesn't this problem solve itself? Particularly if we're making it clear that we're a willing alternative partner. Maybe we don't have to do much at all. People will turn to us instead of China. We can get out of the potential downsides of appearing to escalate. The uh, separate question actually goes to you. Uh, you, you noted that there is a conflict between strategic ambiguity and deterrence and that struck me as 
not necessarily true as I understand uh, the issue. So can you say a bit more about why you see these two as, direct as directly in conflict? And you can answer it, other, t other team members uh, can, or why they need to be in conflict. I can tell myself a story why that might be the case, but I'm not convinced, and historically I'm not convinced that it's true. Well, there's a couple of reasons. Well, so, so well, you can answer well, first. Okay, go ahead. Oh, uh, so, I mean, I think in regards to your, I mean, I think it might be better for another member of the team answers your, your first question out to deal with the strategic ambiguity. Okay. Um, so, so uh, returning back to kind of this argument regarding um, kind of why, why we need to kind of step up if other states are already kind of balancing towards us in response to Chinese rights. That, that, that's kind of Well, the, not the even point. simply balancing, yeah. right? L let's imagine the you know, states have agency, and mm -hmm. it, it, as you're portraying China, they're, setting, they, they're uh, on a mission to coerce and dominate. And if you're a sovereign state out in the international system and you have the opportunity to form partnerships with an alternative actor who you don't view as equally aggressive, why would you? Um, <laughs> allow yourself to end up in a partnership with someone who has got such nefarious aims. Um, so there's just a couple of different ways that you can come back at me, but um, um, it seems like, like I said, that this is a problem that might take care of itself without a whole lot of proactive um, action by the United States. Mm -hmm. Not on the domestic front, but I meant with regard to um, international partnerships. No, definitely. I think so. That's a that, that's an astute point, and certainly, um, you know, it's we are in we're starting from an advantage insofar as we have a series of partners who are excited to work with us against China. Um, I'd like to go to two things. The first is that um, there are real kind of domestic concerns uh, that the United States is has that are threatened by a rising China in a variety of different ways. Um, I can touch on those later, but in thinking about specific um, kind of you know, domestic, uh, so, sorry, specific international partnerships. Um, in, you know, this is a collective action problem, right? This is a, if we don't all step up, the bully wins problem, right? So if, you know, there's certainly an obvious interest for Japan and India to band together, an obvious interest for, um, you know, Japan, India, tying in Australia, tying in the Philippines, but undergirding all of that is American aircraft carriers and the U.S. dollar, right? It's, it's not as though um, independently India, Japan, the Philippines, and Australia don't have the resources to effectively confront China. They lack the naval capability to, to defend their own interests in the um, East and South China Seas or stick up for Taiwan. They also um, kind of lack the unified economic heft. Japan is putting forward a bold effort with the quality infrastructure program to try and um, develop counter relationships with in Southeast Asia. But alone, these efforts fail. It has to be in renewed United States commitment. And over the past, um, you know, it's before the 2010s, before the 2008 kind of time period, right? We'd really turned away from Asia, and we were viewing, you know, China as a sort of rising power that could be fit neatly into the international framework as a responsible stakeholder. They've shown themselves since that period or so to be an increasingly belligerent actor that's trying to develop their own national, uh, their own sort of domestic um, legitimacy through nationalism. They're trying to um, stave off potential domestic concerns by saying, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to be a great nation, we're going to push forward, we're going to encompass um, Taiwan, South China Sea, try and throw our weight around and become a regional hegemon, boxing the United States out and putting our partners at risk. Ben, let's uh, turn this on yeah. over to items so I can get other yeah, people yeah. involved here. Uh, so in regards to the, the shift from strategic ambiguity to clarity, a couple of things. Firstly, ambiguity by definition is ambiguous. If we don't make it clear when we're going to intervene in Taiwan, one, it makes it difficult to really establish red lines to China as to what we consider the, the tripwire for Which US can actually enhance deterrence is the thing. Not necessarily, but, but mm -hmm. it can, right? The threat that leaves something to chance or the uncertainty of our response can actually enhance deterrence, as opposed to figuring out exactly where the red lines are and knowing we can go up to this point or farther. Oh, and sometimes we, we change our mind about what the red lines are. So I'm I, I, just saying. And while that is true, yeah. what we have, I mean, to use an example, 
the, when Vladimir Putin invaded Ukraine, mm -hmm. he didn't invade Estonia or any other NATO country. Why? Because they were under a clear and non-ambiguous American defense agreement. I don't think that's, I think that that doesn't make sense. But <laughs> they evaded, I mean, Ukraine doesn't mean the same thing. But the point is, Russia. is that a NATO country mm -hmm. is considered to be unambiguously under American defense. And if we make it clear that Taiwan is unambiguously under the aegis of the United States, not only does it help sort of establish those red lines to China, it also sends a message to our allies that our aid is going to be there. I think whether we like it or not, the U.S. doesn't have an amazing track record when it comes to defending allies that aren't NATO nations in regards to a defensive war. And I think that if we don't move from ambiguity mm -hmm. to clarity, mm -hmm. I mean, if I'm the Japanese government, I'm going to have to seriously think to myself, well, we know the US is a threat that leaves something to chance, but when, when do I know I'm going to get that American support. How do I know that if a American leader comes into power in the next election and decides, I don't want to be here, they're just going to disappear? It's a lot harder to leave a country in the lurch if you have an explicit guarantee. It's a lot easier if you... <laughs> and let's wrap it up, just so I can get on yeah, to some yeah, other. I just want to get as yeah. many questions and, and people involved. Uh, Mr. Jackson? Okay. Well, I, I do, <laughs> but... Yeah. Um, I have more questions on, on diplomacy, and this, I guess, is for, for anyone. Um, I, I wonder who China will have to turn to after we implement what you're calling an assertive strategy, which sounds a little aggressive more than assertive. Um, we're building up relations uh, in, in, in Asia, we're building up relations in Europe, You've almost hinted that we should be doing more against China in the Global South uh, as well. So China, 10 years from now, might not accept this new world order. I, in fact, I think that's delusional. If I, if I was a Chinese leader, there's no way I would 10 years from now say, we've lost, oh dear, we're going to do whatever the US wants, we'll cooperate on all these other issues, we'll just accept our sort of secondary place in the world order. This is not how great powers behave. So what might China actually do, rather than just accepting uh, its, its uh, uh, secondary position? I would turn to Russia, right? Russia is a de declared foe of the United States, the US declares it it's a foe. Russia is a gigantic great power, huge nuclear arsenal, gigantic resource base, is what you are proposing likely to unite our great power enemies? Okay. <clears throat> a couple of points on that. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, the first of which is that we have seen kind of a, a China turn to Russia or support Russia in the midst of this Russia-Ukraine invasion already. Um, and so it, to me, it, it doesn't seem like it's kind of a, a, that would be a radical shift for them today is, to embrace that. I mean, you can see them embracing that no limits partnership already. Um, the other thing is that I, I kind of would contest the characterization of a, a new order that we'd like to implement. Primarily, our, our focus is defending the order that has reaped benefits for us and for China that China is now kind of seeking to challenge a little bit. So we, we don't want to make no country trade with China. We don't want China to not have access to markets or anything like that, but we would also like not have all of our eggs in the China basket and make sure that China, as we've mentioned a million times, doesn't have leverage over country. So it's, it's more about ke keeping like a U.S. presence to, to prevent kind of a change in the that's beneficial not, status quo. That's not what you said. <laughs> that, that, the goals you very explicitly laid out, um, coercive goals. This is not about maintaining the status quo. This is about convincing China within a decade to put aside its regional ambitions, its national aspirations, Taiwan, and agree to cooperate with the United States on issues the United States thinks are important. This is not the status quo. I, why, why would China do that? Which he's asking the same question I asked you at the outset, which is why doesn't China escalate and respond and say, essentially, bleep you guys, I don't like this. <laughs> I mean, I think we've seen historically that China, when confronted by an assertive and, well, powerful United States, has been willing to
cooperate. I think what we're seeing now isn't that the U.S. is getting weaker, it's that China is closing the gap. As we increase that gap again, I think China as a strong state economically with a large trading network is probably going to want to not take these foreign adventures. It's probably going to want to go back to how it was a few years in the past. We're not radically shifting the, the boat. We're not trying to create some super liberal world order. We, you just want China to lay off attempting to annex Taiwan forcefully as they've been doing for the last few decades. We want China to stop stealing our IP and um, otherwise threatening our allies with coercive ways. I mean, if China wants to pursue ties with Russia, I mean, for one, they've, I mean, as it's been stated, they're, they're doing that pretty, pretty much already. But I mean, at the end of the day, we, we don't really think that that's, I mean, that partnership wouldn't exactly give China all that much than it already has at the moment. It would, if anything, it would just take the allies that we have and the economic reforms that we have and make, make it stronger for us. I also wanted to contest very briefly um, sort of the idea that Russia presents, represents a sort of great power level um, threat to the United States or a, a threat that's equivalent to the sort of growth that China is representing, right? Um, as we've seen in the recent war with Ukraine, you know, and we, as we will see later today, um, there's, there's a kind of significant degree of um, Russian military investment in Ukraine, which has so far proven to be pretty uh, lackluster in, in its effects. We've also seen um, the United States and Europe particularly been able to largely wean itself off of um, trade and bilateral relations with Russia. So I think that you know, what, what we see already is a fairly isolated Russia. Um, Russia's already turning to, towards China, and if Russia turns further towards China, I, I think it's not unreasonable to expect them to be uh, more an additional burden that China has to kind of depend on and use as effectively extracting oil and other natural resources, rather than some kind of great pillar that they can use to unite together against the United States. I don't think that represents a huge risk greater than what's already existing. <coughs> Um, if our experts don't have any more questions, I'll, I'll take uh, one last one. Um, usually, people who advocate a more hawkish position towards China, a Team B perspective, people like Aaron Friedberg, maybe people like Hal Brand say, hey, look, the ultimate goal has to be changing China's internal system. As long as the CCP rules in the way it does, um, you're going to have an aggressive China. You guys are remarkably silent about uh, what, if anything, um, you think about the Chinese Communist Party running the system the way it is. Do you envision this policy like our original containment policy will kind of create pressures within China that will lead to uh, some sort of different regime that doesn't pursue what you consider to be hostile policies? Or is your policy based on uh, what you see is what you get? It's not going to change and this internal system in China will go on for you know, decades ahead. Just wonder whether you guys gave any thought to those sorts of issues. Yeah, our policy is much more based in the second set of circumstances that you laid out. I don't believe that any efforts to drastically shift the way the Chinese Communist Party or the Chinese government functions um, will be effective, and I do think that's an overreach or an overstep of our capabilities when instead we need to be focusing our time elsewhere. Um, not so much trying to directly influence how the Chinese government operates and how China as a state operates, but more so how we can balance against that and in our alliances and um, ties in the region effectively deter further action from China regardless of what their government looks like. I think that's, a, that's another way that we're, that we're concerned about the escalation problem that you brought up as well. Like we're not advocating for regime change, we're not trying to escalate into any sort of Cold War conflict or whatever. That's, that's not the, the priority. We have many, many more questions to go, but uh, I just want to thank uh, everyone for a wonderful presentation, and we will uh, reconvene at 11. There's, there's coffee and donuts in the back, but, but thank you very much.